So it's a pleasure today to have uh, Jorgen Dock and uh, for the invited for the seminar, and it's a quite special seminar because uh, uh, I, I, the, the speaker is a quite special speaker with respect to the standard that we have uh, here in the lab, in the sense that is uh, I mean is uh, for us, for me, Claire and uh, Sebastian is like a, a star. <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, he answered all our questions on the forum of Phoenix, which is a software that uh, we use for doing finite element. And indeed, uh, on this, this forum, it has uh, like uh, 2,000 like uh, from people. I think uh, this translates in uh, days of uh, PhD students uh, working saved, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> Because uh, he answered all the questions in a nice way, in a very kind and exact way. And you started, uh, the story goes that you started during COVID doing that, <laughs> during the pandemic, uh, try to be helpful for people. And, uh, and so now, for me, you are a famous <laughs> guy for us all. Also. And you helped a lot also for the teaching because, um, I mean, uh, at a given point, we, we, we are teaching with Claire and Sebastian class uh, using Phoenix to master students. And uh, Sebastian started yelling to me, yelling to me, because uh, we s decided to switch to the new version of Phoenix, and uh, <laughs> it was a nightmare because we were passing night before the class to prepare the changes from one script to the other, and you saved our life in this situation also because with your tutorial everything was done in advance. So, but you are also a researcher. Uh, doing research on, uh, uh, so you, you, Jorgen did um, a PhD in uh, Norway, in Simula Lab, on uh, um, to, um, the shape optimization, I was saying topology optimization. Uh, and then you started in this situation, I think, uh, doing Phoenix, uh, working with Phoenix, and then he did a postdoc with Gert Wells in uh, Cambridge, and now you are working in, uh, in uh, Simula, and uh, We'll talk about a little bit about Phoenix uh, in general. I asked him to do that. And then uh, he will talk also about his research work more specifically on uh, contact and multipoint constraints in finite elements and uh, the implementation he developed. Thank you for these kind words. So today I'll talk about different kinds of extensions we've done to Phoenix to do boundary conditions. But before we do that I need to talk a bit about Phoenix, so that's the first thing we'll do. Uh, all of this work started while I was in Cambridge with my collaborators Chris, Sarah and Garth. Uh, but of course since it's software, software keeps on growing and keeps on having to be maintained, so it's still ongoing and we still keep on developing new stuff. So the idea is to first do the brief overview of Phoenix X and then go into multipoint constraints which is going to lead us into more complicated boundary conditions for contact. So we can start with just the standards of finite elements. We have uh, an equation, uh, a strong form of an equation, and we want to make our weak formulation. And it's easy to make the weak formulation with integration by parts and multiplying by a suitable test function. And then we need to choose, like, okay, what kind of test functions and what kind of trial space do we want to use? We might want to use Lagrange elements, say third order, uh, which has these nice basis functions. But we could also say, I want to use some more exotic elements, say Nedlec elements, and you can want to, want to use these for arbitrary order. So if you, if you want to cover every element under the sun when you implement stuff by yourself, that's going to be a nightmare because generating find elements and tabulating find elements is. Uh, quite a lot of work, so you don't want to do this by yourself. But you also need to think about the going from a uh, reference domain to the uh, physical domain, and you need to have the, these mappings and to do your integrals. So these are all components that most of the people that do PDs, all of them have, to, all, everyone has to do them, but they are tedious to do because if you have to implement all of these things yourself, that is going to take forever. Um, and we, if we've chosen our basis functions, we can get a matrix uh, such as this. So we get our local element matrix with the basis functions with the determinant of the mapping. So this is just the basics of, okay, given any finite element uh, or any weak form, we end up with some matrix and we'll end up with some uh, vector. And with these, 
uh, you would like to integrate these and we would do this numerically, so we choose a quadrature rule. And you, of course, don't want to repeat this every time for every PDE you want to solve because you want, might want to solve variations of PDE. So you want, might start with Poisson, everyone can set up a Poisson problem, but then you want to go into heat equations and maybe have nonlinear boundary conditions. And you don't want to keep on re-implementing these things time and time again. So that's why you want to have a finite element library that does this for you. So the Phoenix project is a project that tries to solve one of these problems. It's an open source software available on GitHub, previously uh, Bitbucket. It was initiated in 2003, way before I started doing finite elements. And it has been ongoing research since then. And it has collaborators all over the world. The, the first collaborators were in Sweden and the US mainly, and some in the Netherlands. Now there are contributors all around the world, uh, including Jack over here. Uh, and we have many people in Cambridge, we have some people at Simla, and people are just spread all around the world doing the core development, and we also have users all around the world. Uh, estimating, I would say, at least 2,000 active users, uh, because that's how many users we have on the forum, and the forum is only four years old, and we get about two to 10,000 visits on that forum every month. So we have quite a lot of traffic and quite a lot of researchers that want to use Phoenix. So some of you might have heard about Phoenix uh, since it started in 2003, but what we're working on now is Phoenix X, which is the next generation Phoenix. And what is important with the next generation Phoenix is that it should be parallelized all the way through. So no code goes into the source code without working in parallel, because we're now in the situation where everyone has access to supercomputers and we don't want to have code that only works in zero or has a very hidden expensive cost once you're running it in parallel. So we want everything to be designed in a way that it would work in parallel with MPI. We support uh, unordered non-affine geometries, uh, including triangles, tetrahedra, quadrilaterals, and hexahedra. We're also working on getting prism support and like mixed topologies in, but they're not there yet. But the important thing is that we can do these non-affine geometries, so higher order uh, geometries, and we do not do isopyrometric elements, so you do not have to match the element of your find element space to the element of your, um, uh, your geometry, which makes it more flexible than the more traditional find element software. We also support complex numbers. Of course, complex numbers is a bit tricky to support since there aren't that many good linear algebra backends for them, but we are able to uh, do complex numbers, which is just a nice feature to have that the old Phoenix didn't have. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is how uh, Dolphin X is built up. So it's built up, or Phoenix X, I'll use these words interchangeable, because Dolphin X and Phoenix X, it kind of goes together because Dolphin X is the user interface of the Phoenix project, while the Phoenix project is the col collection of all these modules. So we'll go through each of these modules now in turn. So we'll start with uh, the unified form language, which is the the backbone of Phoenix and one of the main reasons why Phoenix is successful. So the unified form language is a, is a language written in Python to write variational forms. So as we saw on uh, the previous slides, when we want to make our variational form, we want to usually take some inner product or dot product between some vectors, maybe with some gradients, and we want to integrate them over uh, a, me a, a mesh or a mesher but the, we don't really care about what the mesh looks like when we want to specify these problems. So we can start by saying, okay, I want to have tri triangular cells. I want my mesh to be a third order mesh. So we say that the mesh is based on a vector Lagrange element of third order. And this is so that we can map from the reference to the physical domain and back. Then we say, okay, I might just want a second order Lagrange space for my function space. And then we can define our trial and test functions. And we create A, which is the inner product of U and V in this case, which is just a mass matrix. But this is how you can specify your problem without thinking about the actual boundary conditions or what mesh you're solving this on. This is just very generic. And then we need to, of course, tabulate these basis uh, functions in some way because we want to tabulate them. So there we have basics, which is a C++ Python library or a C++ library with a Python interface, uh, where you can create any finite element, uh, like most finite elements, there is an extensive list online. Uh, you can create the element either in C++ or Python, and you can tabulate 
any ordered derivative at any point. So here we have an example where we take some points in the reference element, uh, we create the second order Lagrange on the quadrilateral, uh, and we tabulate the zero first and second order derivatives at those points. And then we just get an MPRA with these values. So with this, you're gotten quite far. You have your basis functions, so you can now, you could just set up your own assembly with this. You can, of course, create more advanced Lagrange elements. So the, most people know the equispace Lagrange elements. When you go to higher order, you just equispace the points on the facets. But that is not uh, suitable for a very high order because then you get wild oscillations in your basis functions. So you can choose what kind of variant you want to use for Lagrange, and you just do that by using any of the about 10 supported variants that we have in basics. So in this way, you can create most find elements and you can create them quite easily, and you can easily use them for tabulation. You also have an example here of how to do net leg elements, and you can also make your, you can also get quadrature rules from our library. So we have some hard coded for like uh, efficient, really high order, like 16th, 17th order quadrature, but we also generate quadrature uh, rules for like GLL uh, so that you don't have to implement this yourself. So now we've covered the two first components here. So we covered basics and UFL. So now we, we have our variational form in, on a symbolic level, and we have a way to get basis functions at any point. So what do we then need to do? So if we think that the previous uh, problem we had was added to a file called problem.py, we use the FX, FFCX Python module to first expand the UFL expression that we see on the second line here, which just tells you that you have a basis function multiplied by the conjugate of another on the mesh that we want to do this everywhere. And we want to now pull this back to the reference element. So that's what we see in these lines here. So we see that we pull this back so we have the quadrature weight times the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian times the basis functions still on a symbolic level. And it estimates what quadrature you want to do. So it looks at the elements that we have and it uh, sees, okay, the Jacobian uh, on a simplex is constant. So we, we can estimate the polynomial degrees, the quadrature degrees, we can decide on quadrature rules and how, what the precision we want to use for assembling. So with this, we can then create a graph of the expression we saw on the last page. So what we see here is a graph computation uh, or a graph of the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian. And then we see that this here is multiplied by the one basis function and another basis function. So when we have this direct acyclic graph, we can now set up a set of operations that we can use. And of course, this graph differs if you do this on the mass matrix, then you see that all these terms are blue, which means that on a simplex triangle, so like your first order triangle, all of these values, you don't just need to compute them once because the Jacobian is constant on that element. But if you do this on a quadrilateral, which isn't affine, then you see that all of these values that are in red are values that would be different for every quadrature point. So then we have instructions on, do we want to put things inside the quadrature loop or outside the quadrature loop? So here the only constant thing is minus one. And of course the basis functions depend on the uh, quadrature, so they, they, they're just not in this bit of the graph. So we can put all of this together. When we have this graph, we generate very efficient uh, C code that we can then interface to Python. So we have an interface between C code and Python. So if you give us a variational form, we give you C code that you can easily use to assemble your problem. So here we have a full example for a Poisson problem with non-homogeneous Neumann and Dirichlet conditions. So the first thing we do is we create a mesh. We say that we want a 20 by 30 mesh, uh, unit square, and we want this to be able to run in parallel in a partition fashion, so we set, send in an MPI communicator. The next thing we do is to define the function space. So here we just use the Dolphin X interface saying we want a fourth order Lagrange element. Uh, we could send in any order, or we could be more specific and use basics to define the element if you want a special element, or if you want to use the custom in, uh, element interface of basics. So in basics, if you can define your find element with the Kiarle definition, you can create it with just sending in a set of arrays, and we can use it directly in Dolphin X. Next, we start by locating the entities we have on the boundary. 
So what we do there is we send in the mesh, we say that we want to find all the facets that satisfies uh, this relation. So the, what we send in here is x as a three by uh, number of points in MPRA. And we want to then do a vectorized check to check are any of the x coordinates equal to zero or are any of the x equal coordinates equal to one. So then we clamp these or we set the clear condition on the side of the domain. And we then find the degrees of freedom also as an MPRA. So it's easy to access and you can easily inspect it. It's not some obscure C object or C++ object. And we, we create a Dirichlet condition here on these dots in this function space and we give them the value one. Then we use UFL to create the variational form as we've seen already. So UFL supports uh, gradients, it supports inner products, it uh, has uh, some of the more trigonometric functions implemented as well. So we can define the exponential, we can define a uh, sine of 5x, and we can now define our linear, linear and bilinear form A and L. And we then want to interface this with Petsy so we can solve it. So we have a wrapper around Petsy that says, given a bilinear form and a linear form and a set of boundary conditions, solve this with Petsy with, with these options from Petsy, and we can get the solution. So that's, that's how we can use it. And of course now, as you see here, you can now change the bilinear and linear form to whatever you'd like, as long as it can be represented in UFL. So if you want to solve Navier-Stokes, nonlinear elasticity, you want to use a splitting scheme, or you want to do uh, Newton iterations for this, and you want to do this by hand, you can do this because we, we give you the flexibility of just writing simple forms in the unified form language, and then we generate all the code for you. So you save a lot of work. But of course, not everything is in the core of DolphinX because we want everything to be parallel. We want everything to be well-maintained and easily maintained. And then you would like to build extension on top of this. So some things that we haven't added directly into the core of DolphinX uh, instead have added outside of it is periodic conditions. So if you have u at x equal to zero is equal to u at the uh, equal to l, we want to have a periodic condition and this can be a this can be implemented in quite a lot of ways and to make sure that this is easy to uh, parallelize, this is implemented outside the Dolphin X core. We also have conditions like slip boundary conditions, like you could do them uh, weakly enforced with Nietzsche, but if you want a strong enforcement, this is not something that is inside the core of the Dolphin X library because you can do this in quite a lot of different ways. So you need to make sure that you, you have one consistent way of doing it. And of course, things like uh, contact between meshes. So here we say, see two non-matching meshes with a, an interface that is more or less common. And if you apply a force on this side and we fix this side, we want there to be no penetration between these two bodies. And these are just things that one is quite tricky to implement and quite tricky to do in a general fashion. So you want to keep these things as extensions. And that is why uh, I've generated a library for this that we will talk about now. So if we start with these kind of conditions, so usually they, there, there is some linear combination of degrees of freedom. And uh, imagine that we just have four degrees of freedom, u0 to u3. Uh, and we say that we have a, a linear system, au is equal to b, where the third degree of freedom is constrained by the zero degree of freedom. If we just write out what that means, if we create a prolongation matrix that reduces the problem to this smaller subset of degrees of freedom, uh, where you can multiply by a prolongation matrix to get the full uh, set of equations, we can multiply the matrix A on the left and right by uh, this P to get a reduced system that is just a three by three system. And then we see that we get a contribution wherever you have non-zero contributions between any DOF on the row that is constrained by another uh, or any column. So we get quite a lot of new entries in this matrix. And what happens if we make this slightly uh, more general? So we say, okay, we have one degree of freedom, u1, is uh, constrained by the sum of the zero and the second one. If we create the same prolongation matrix, uh, uh, or a new prolongation matrix for this problem, and we look at the entries, we now see that we have these same terms as we had before with all the alphas, but we now also have cross terms alpha and beta. So we get more uh, interactions if these uh, coefficients a11 uh, are non-equal uh, zero. And of course, if we then say we have two constraints, so we have 
u1 is equal to alpha u0 and uh, plus beta u2, and you have u3 is equal to zeta u0, we get this kind of prolongation matrix, and this reduces the system to a two by two system. But now we have interactions in between these two different linear equations. So you get a lot of extra uh, contributions in your matrix that you don't know about before you've actually assembled your problem. So this adds a lot of potential non-zero entries to your matrix. And this means that you do not want to do this uh, matrix, uh, matrix, matrix multiplication on a global level because that might be really, really expensive because before you set up the prolongation matrix, you don't know how many non-zero entries you're actually going to enter into your, your system. So this slide we can now skip because we've been through this. Uh, but we can then see how I've implemented this. So what I did is I built on top of Dolphin X. So Dolphin X works with UFL to create your variational forms. You generate your code uh, for the assembly kernels. And then in my library, we've added the functionality to extend the DOF maps to uh, take into account that you can have these conditions. So you add extra information uh, on, your, on the each individual process about which degrees of freedom could be constrained to others and how they map to each other. So especially when you think about this in parallel, if you have a periodic condition between two boundaries and they're partitioned in the middle, so that this is on process zero, this is on process one, you now need to add extra information on each side so that they know that they now need to communicate with each other and have entries in your matrix. So the, the multipoint constraint library then talks to the linear algebra backend, which is Petsy, and it generates these new matrices where it takes in the local element matrices from uh, Dolphin X. So if we take in AE that has been assembled on the reference element in Dolphin X, we then first start preparing AE for the clear boundary conditions, and we do this uh, with lifting. Then we check if that element matrix has any constrained DOFs. If it has any constrained DOFs, we modify the local uh, element matrix to remove uh, the entries that should be constrained, so they're not no longer in the matrix. We add the global contributions from all, these, all of these cross terms to the appropriate master degree of freedom, and we insert that into the global matrix, and we repeat this for all cells and all facets if we have any facet intervals. So with that design, we can solve problems such as this, where we have one box that has a coarser mesh and we have a finer mesh, and we constrain all the finer degrees of freedom to the coarse mesh. If you do it the opposite way, you'll have issues that this node here can penetrate through this uh, tetrahedron. And that is one of the limitations of multipoint constraints that you need to be very careful about how you set them up. But you can solve problems such as this, uh, and we also then wanted to investigate how does this affect the sparsity pattern of the problem. So if you consider that problem on uh, the previous slide, we see here the sparsity pattern of the, uh, the matrix for linear elasticity, where we have no contact are all the red entries, and the contact contributions are the uh, blue uh, crosses here. So we see that we get a whole lot of non-local contributions to our matrix system, which means that it might be more tricky to solve. That's like something one then has to investigate. And we can see how at the di diagonal, wherever you have a DOF that is constrained, we see that we only have an, ident we have only have an entry at the, um, at the diagonal, which is a one, because we want to not solve for this. We just set that whole row and column to uh, identity column or row. So then the question is, does this scale? So what we did, we took that contact problem that you saw, and we kept on refining it until we had 221 million cells. And we then tested this with uh, a set of different MPR ranks, starting at 256 MPR ranks, then doing 512, then doing 1024. And what we see here is a breakdown of the cost of the problem. So we can see that the solving time we're using Pepsi GAMG, it does reduce if you increase the number of processes. It's not quite optimal scaling, but it's quite good scaling. It's the iteration counts for these are the, the numbers written here. So you see that there is a slight increase in iteration count, which would then account for the increase in runtime. But it's not horrible. It doesn't explode with the increasing number of processes. But this is some, some place where one has to put some more work, because you shouldn't treat geometric multigrid or um, 
geometric algebraic multigrid as a black box because that is uh, there are so many parameters that you would need to tune there to make sure that that scales properly. But here we've done some tuning and it works quite well. And then you see the other contributions here. So initializing the MPC scales really well. And that's because we're using uh, MPI neighborhood communicators to set up this communication. So there's never any communication between all of the processes to figure out uh, what degrees of freedom are constrained by the others. We see that the contact constraint to set that up, because initializing the MPC, the MPC can take in any lin set of linear combinations of uh, constraints. But we also have to say for this specific problem, we have contact constraints where we want to just say u dot n on one side is equal to u dot n on the other surface. And that also scales really well with increasing number of processes. Uh, and we, can, we don't even see the assemble of the vector because that contribution is so small because just assembling a vector isn't very expensive compared to all the other issues here. So the, this implementation is available on GitHub uh, under my username and dolphinx underscore npc. And what you would do is you take any dolphinx code and you take the function space and say, I want to make a multipoint constraint on that function space. Then we want to, for these kind of contact conditions, we want to have an, a normal at every degree of freedom on a given surface. But that normal, if the normal, if you have a degree of freedom at a vertex, that normal is not well defined. So we then, I then have a function for approximating that normal by taking the averages of cells uh, with a given facet mark with number four. So you get a, a normal at every vertex, which is fine if you have quite flat surfaces. If you have surfaces that have kinks, this can be problematic. And that is why you would have to restrict what number of facets you send in here to create your approximation. So imagine if you have something like this and you want to create the normal here, the normal with my approximation would go out like this, which is an approximation, but is not perfect when you want to actually have something come into contact there. So that's something that one has to keep in mind when doing these kind of strong conditions. Then we can create a contact slip condition by saying we want to take all facets marked with 4 and 9 and constrain them together with the contact condition. Then we define the variational problem as usual using UFL. So here you could set up a linear elasticity problem. You can change your, uh, your uh, elastic parameters to be uh, spatially varying. You can have different subdomains with different values. You can use all the nice features of Phoenix X. And then we use uh, the special assemble, assemble matrix and assemble vector functions from Dolphin X MPC. And then we can use Petsy to solve this because what this returns is Petsy objects. So then you can use Petsy and all the power of Petsy to decide on how you want to solve your problem. Once you've solved your problem, you need to back substitute the degrees of freedom that weren't in the equation. And that's what you do on the last line here. So then we've covered how to do MPCs and how this just works on top of Dolphin X instead of being somewhere hidden in the core, which makes it a lot easier for me to modify and adapt to new use cases. And if anyone has any use cases and you want to try it, let me know. And if, you, if it doesn't work, just put an issue and I'll reply as fast as possible. So now we'll go over to contact mechanics. Uh, and all of the following slides are based on work by Sarah Rogendorf at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's a postdoc there and we worked together on contact for about two years. Uh, and she's still working on that. And we did this together with Chris Richardson and Garth Wells as our uh, supervisors. So the motivation for this are our jet engine. So this is a part of a jet engine where we have the base of the jet engine. We want to slot in a single blade. And I say slot in because these blades are not welded into place. There is an actual gap between the, the uh, blade of the uh, turbine and the engine. And this, these are just kept in place by uh, contact forces. So we were working uh, with Rolls-Royce to model a full jet engine. And these are one of the problems that they want to solve, is contact between complex geometries where there is an initial gap in between uh, the, the two domains. And that's where multipoint constraints was an initial idea for how to do this. But then we realized doing this gap function is not going to be feasible or scalable in any way with multipoint constraints. And also because of the issues with which side of the mesh should be constrained to the other, this is not a feasible way to solve this problem. So if you look at this from a mathematical point of view, uh, we have two bodies, omega 1 and omega 2. They have an initial distance between them that we don't know. 
Uh, and we want to compute the distance from one body to the other. That's where we'll start today. So we can do this by doing a closest point projection. So the closest point on this, from this point to this point is this. While this is not in, like the, the map is not invertible if you go from the other side. So if you're there, the closest point is there. So the, these are assumptions that uh, one has to think about because all the papers that start with these problems start with, we assume that this map is invertible. This map isn't invertible, so you would only have to, well, it's not, a, it's not its own inverse, so you wouldn't be able to go back and forth. So what you need to do here is that we, we start with a problem where these bodies are very, very close, but there is an unknown gap. So we'll start with small deformation, and that's based on the work by Choli. I want to solve the equations of linear elasticity on these, uh, each of these bodies. And we want to have some contact conditions. So we'll now see what contact conditions you want to do. We want there to be no penetration between the objects. And we say that G is the difference between the projection and the initial point. We say that the normal stresses uh, has to be smaller or equal to 0. So they, if there are stresses, they have to point inwards. And the stresses are only there if there is contact. So these are the standard contact conditions. And you can rewrite these as an equality constraint. So there, there are proofs in the paper that I referenced above, above for this, where you say that we can now write each of these stresses in this way, where we have the negative restriction of the function. So now we've gone from having uh, these inequalities to having a non, uh, like a nonlinear uh, problem instead. So we have done something, but is it good enough for what we want to do? We can also model friction. So there, there is Coulomb friction uh, for these kind of models, and there is Tresca friction. And today I'll not cover implementation of this, but the implementation of this is uh, ongoing, and you can look at that in our repository. Uh, you can write all of these uh, as uh, equality constraints as well, so that's the, that's the good thing. So you can get equality constraints, which means that we can put them into a standard variational formulation. So now we'll go back to the approximation of the gap. So if you start with the closest point, we'll start on the undeformed bodies, and we'll try to obtain the initial gap. So we'll start by doing that. So we get the initial gap as this. Then say we, we want to solve this problem, so we, we get the perturbation field that looks like this. Then what we, we can see then, if we only look at, OK, we had this initial gap. And now we have this perturbation. What is the gap in between these two points now with that current projection? That gap is now this. So the, the gap is not then accurate anymore. Uh, but the good thing is that you only compute this projection from one point to the other once. So this is a, a very simple way to solve this problem. Uh, the gap function is linear in U. So it's easy to differentiate to get your Newton solver going. Uh, but it's very inaccurate for sliding or tangential movement, so we can all already see that here, that this point now is a lot further away from this point than it was, so this is not a suitable approach for large deformations and sliding. So what one would do then instead is to compute the closest point on the deformed mesh. So we then first deform the mesh, we then find the closest point projection, but this uh, is one, it has to be computed within your Newton solver. And you also have the problem that uh, if it's computed within your Newton solver and these things move tangentially, you need possi possibly to know a lot about uh, how your domain is partitioned. So you have the enough information on each process to communicate this back and forth. But you also have the issue that this now the the gap on, from this side is dependent on the normal on this side because we're using closest points. So this angle has to be 90 degrees. And this uh, becomes uh, quite dif difficult to differentiate. But it's very applicable. So it's a, it's a better method, but it comes with some uh, quite big costs. Then we can look at an alternative, which is ray tracing. So if we now have this body, and we want to do ray tracing from this body, we just take the normal, uh, normal vector and we see where does this normal vector hit. So this does 
have a solution. It might have multiple solutions on a, uh, because it might uh, inter like uh, hit a body multiple times, but it also might have no solutions, which is not uh, not a problem for closest points because closest point you can always find a closest point, but you might not always find a ray that hits another uh, body. So we have now the ray tracing from each of the domains, but we see that this is the inverse of the closest point. So we we can now use these map in the opposite way and see does that help us. The derivatives are a lot easier because if we look now at this, if we deform this body now, the normal that we have and the gap we have on this side is only dependent on the normal from its own body. So it's easier to compute these derivatives, which makes our life a lot easier when we want to implement this and compute the actual derivatives. Uh, there are also some other benefits. That is that it's likely, uh, less likely to be a non-regular point because if we have the ray coming out of here, if we actually have our domain with a kink where we have a non-differentiable point here on the geometry, you can only hit that if you hit uh, precisely this point. Well, if you have a closest point projection from this side, all of this area here actually hits this point and can cause a lot of issues in your Newton iteration because you do not know which, uh, which facet you're constrained to and you have a non-differentiable normal and there are a whole lot of issues with this. So just to repeat what we've looked at so far, we've looked at a two-body problem where we have some way of computing the gap in between them. And there are multiple ways of doing it. Some are more challenging than the other. And we want to use equality constraints to solve this uh, with a Newton story, so nonlinear equality constraints. So how to do this, we do it with Nietzsche's method. So we start by integrating by parts as normal on each body. Then we get these potential contact area uh, terms, which are the normal terms you get by integration by parts, but we do not know the size of this area. So we need to take these and we now need to rewrite them in three steps. So we'll start by using a uh, balance of momentum, then introduce some each parameters and we will replace the surface traction with the appropriate traction condition. So you can first start with just a contact problem and solve the contact problem for no friction and then you need to see what can I do to treat the friction. So we start by using momentum balance and say that the contact forces are equal and opposite. So we start by saying that the, the forces on one uh, on the one domain has to be equal, equal to the forces on the other side. And we can then rewrite this on the surface. So we rewrite it from one surface to the other. Uh, and there are a lot of normals in here. So one needs to really be careful about using the correct normal here. So now we have the same normals in here. And we can then write this as the, uh, the half of each of them, which is quite neat because this means that from either side of your, uh, of your contact term, you can get a contribution from the other. So then we can get an unbiased formulation that doesn't have this concept of master and slave or master and puppet or what you would like to call it. So we can do this and then we can then map from one to the other with the appropriate map to get a single um, single uh, term for the um, for the traction on each side. So we can do this, and then we need to do a, a mathematical trick, which is taking the jump of v and adding extra terms here, which is plus or minus. So we add something at zero, and this is the trick of the Nietzsche method for contact. You add these terms to make sure that your problem is uh, coercive. And you can do this uh, with a symmetric, anti-symmetric, or penalty-like methods. And these are all covered in the papers of Chuli and uh, Mlika. So with this, we can rewrite the condition we had on the previous slide so that we get uh, these terms in there. And then we can replace the original surface, uh, uh, track, uh, surface term. And we start by frictionless contact saying that, OK, we don't have any tangential forces. And then we can. Uh, replace these terms in the variational form so we get, uh, get the Nietzsche form for this problem. But as we've seen here, we have two bodies with two different surfaces, and this doesn't fit into the unified form language. So all the things that we've done so far is to set up a variational problem, and you would think this is perfect for the unified form language. You could put this in there, but it doesn't have the notion of non-matching surfaces. So if we then look at what we have. We could generate all the standard terms of linear elasticity with FFC. We can send that into Dolphin X. 
but all these contact terms we can't really express in the framework we have here. So what we've done instead is to say that we use basics for contact. So we start with taking some measure from Dolphin X. We say that these surfaces are potential contact surfaces. We identify the correct pairs. We distribute them nicely with MPI. And then say, OK, we want to add some extra terms to uh, the matrices vectors that we get from the linear algebra backend. So we then add these to the matrices vectors already generated by Dolphin X so that we can set up these kind of contact problems. So the implementation is available at uh, Wells Group Asimov Contact. Uh, and uh, most of what we've implemented is based on this paper by Malika. And also all the work we've done has been, we've looked through all the papers by Julie as well, which is one of the co-authors of um, Malika, which does all these nature methods in, I think, is GetFem. So if you look at how the results look like, so we take two cylinders that are uh, perpendicular on each other, and we apply a Dirichlet condition on top here, the clear condition on the bottom here, and say that everything on the top surface of this and bottom surface of this could be potential contact uh, regions. We can then solve this problem with this extension, uh, and we can see that we, we do not get penetration in this area. But of course, this is, this is, this is a good problem, because here you need, really need to think about what kind of um, projection method you use, because if you use ray tracing here, all the rays are going to go and hit, not hit the body. So you're going to have a very tiny surface here where the rays are going to be correct. So for this problem, you should be able to just use closest points. And in the uh, library, we've made the option so people can choose which kind of implementation of the gap they want to use to make sure that you can choose the appropriate gap function for your problem. Then since we're closing in on uh, Christmas and we were also inspired by these turbines that were slotted into place, uh, we tried to do this where we have this box here which is fixed on the outside uh, and then we apply some traction on the Christmas tree and we try to push that Christmas tree downwards and we see can we identify all these contact regions which for the library it doesn't have any information about which area on this Christmas tree is in contact with which area on the outside and this works quite well as well. Um, and then we try this in 3D as well because uh, it's nice to have some nice 3D figures and we also get uh, good contact conditions wherever we, um, we should have contact. But of course the big question then is does this scale? Like I told, I told you about there, there might be many issues uh, that we could hit. So one of the things you have to do when you think about contact in parallel is to say okay we might have on one process we might have all the this information and on the other process we have the other surface. And if you do not have that information on that process which is called uh, having ghosts on that process, you don't know that they're going to be into contact. So you need to be able to say we have a ghosting into area here that is also on this process even if it's owned by the other process. Uh, and to, to get this area we use um, closest point or ray tracing, so that's also up to the user, and how much of an area you want to do from any given initial contact point that you can identify with a closest point or ray tracing, the user can decide. But of course, the more uh, cells you, you add on the surface, the more expensive the computation is going to be. So we, we tried with this problem where we wanted to put this geometry inside this, and then we applied uh, attraction on both these surfaces uh, and we, we also moved this uh, domain, the outer domain, downward slightly. And then we get this nice solution uh, where we have some contact areas here, 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 uh, here and here. We have some contact areas over here that you can't quite see in this problem and it has about 650,000 DOFs. And then we looked at, okay, if we run this problem, how long does it take? And we decompose it into like what is ideal scaling if you start up here. Um, and then we looked at how much time does linear solve take and how much time does the contact detection take. And what you can see here is that we do not have perfect scaling. Like the runtime reduces, but it's far from perfect. There's a lot of work that could be done here. But at least it does reduce. It doesn't increase with the number, of course. And then we did a weak scaling test where we keep 
uh, the problem size is fixed per process, and then you uh, then you increase the number of processes, the, process, the problem becomes bigger and bigger. And what we see here is a breakdown of the different costs. So what we can see is that assembly of contact on your local uh, part of your problem is is scalable. The linear solver is not quite scalable, but it isn't. It isn't awful if we start here and go to say 256. The contact contact detection is working quite well. It has some variability with a number of processes, but it isn't it isn't exploding in time. But the, creating a ghosting area is really 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 expensive. You can also see the amount of time used for the ghosting here is like 140 seconds versus 12 seconds. So the the just creating these ghosting areas with the increasing amount of processes is quite tricky to get right. So that's one of the things that uh, is being worked on to reduce this time so we can get the better scaling of the problem. So today I've covered quite a lot of different things. So I've just here added a list of all the links that uh, I've shown on uh, any of the slides and the toys for the papers that uh, I've referenced. And um, if you want any of these, please get in touch with me. I have a web page at jsdocking.com and you can also find me on the forum as uh, was mentioned earlier, like I usually reply within a day or less. Thanks a lot for your excellent talk. <laughs> so uh, if you have any question. So um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I used to apply constraints using Lagrange multipliers mm -hmm. within the variational forms. Um, I, so what's the, what are the pros and cons of using MPC versus uh, yeah, the okay. Lagrange multiplier way? Uh, I'm, I'm not doing contact problems, mm -hmm. but uh, for general constraints. Well, so it's like you could, like the, the current limitation is the, what kind of Lagrange multipliers you can use in Dolphin X. There are some there that you just can't uh, do. And uh, Lagrange multipliers between bodies that are not actually in contact could be a bit tricky to do, but it's just with what it is, in, it is within the framework. So I would say Lagrange multipliers is a good way of doing things if you have a nice way of implementing it. Uh, like I, I don't have anything against them. Uh, sometimes it's a bit tricky to choose the spaces, but if you, if you know what you're doing, I, I think they're a, they're a good way to do most of these problems especially like slip kind of problems. And also your constraints are geometrical in a way, no? In yeah. the sense that they are not on the field zone, are already on the geometry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, Do you have uh, other questions? Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Perhaps a, a naive question for uh, I don't use finite element that much. What is the interest of having this non isoparametric flexibility that you quote at the beginning, having a so specific space for the mesh and an over for the? I I think one of the reasons for that is is one is that you usually many people just use first order geometries. Like it's historically been used a lot. But you might want to have, uh, if the geometry is just a cube, you don't need to have many extra nodes on your actual mesh geometry. You, but you would might maybe have a, a higher order field in, in your domain that you want to solve for. So that's one reason for having different elements for the geometry and for the, um, for the find element function space. But also if you want to do these more advanced elements like NEDLEC elements where the degrees of freedom are integral moments, so they're not just point evaluations, uh, creating elements that adhere to that can be a bit strange for some of these. So it, in some of the more commercial find element solvers, you have a lot of uh, constraints on what kind of meshes you need to send in to solve different problems. Here we can just say, okay, I have my linear geometry, then you can use any find element space on that linear geometry. Or you have a quadratic geometry, then you can choose to any find element you would like to do. So it gives you more flexibility from the meshing point of view. Thanks a lot. So on this point of the higher order geometries, what what are the methodologies that you showed there work with the higher order? Uh, MPC does mm -hmm. uh, contact. We we're, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we started adding some of it. Uh, the 
the main issue there you, now this is going to be detailed but i know you know the details is to have these mesh views mm -hmm. and make sure that they work nicely in a higher order so you just have a view of a surface because that's one of the implementation things that we take the surface of the geometry and we create a surface mesh that we can uh, perturb to get all of these projections, projections. and gaps. Mm -hmm. So then we, we just need to make sure that all of that is uh, working nicely in parallel. So in serial, most things work nicely anyhow, but just to get the parallel implementation proper for the contact bit, we just need to take some extra care to check corner cases there. But MPC does work in mm -hmm. high order. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. Super, super intriguing. I am, um, um, I am wondering. Um, so I am intrigued by the problems where actually things break, and I wonder: Have you tried to solve higher order problems with these uh, nonlinear uh, inequalities, like eigenvalue problems, for example? Uh, I've also for for M with MPCs, I've we've tried some eigenvalue problems, but I haven't considered many of them. Like that's mostly users that have done it. I haven't looked at it at all myself. But you think that the same implementation would work and could be tested for uh, eigenvalues? I think so. There, there is at least one example with MPC for eigenvalues that I know gives reasonable results, but I haven't, I haven't thought a lot about it, so I wouldn't give any guarantees. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, um, a question. So you reformulate your variational inequalities like uh, an equality. Why? What do you, I mean, there is a significant advantage instead of leaving the the work of uh, solving the inequalities to the solver. Yeah. Well, so uh, one of the reasons is that we wanted to. Well, we we looked at like mortar methods. We looked at Lagrange multiplier methods, and we didn't want to ex extend our finite element uh, space with Lagrange multipliers or a new kind of geometry, like pseudo geometry for the surface. We were thinking, okay, the first thing we should do is to try to use the function space we already have. And then we saw, okay, Nietzsche methods, this is how they formulated with Nietzsche methods, and we've just been following that approach. So when we initially started, we were thinking maybe we should just do Lagrange multipliers instead. But then we were thinking for the, for the convenience of getting something up and running, this was easier. So that's my uh, No, the, but well, I was saying, because you can use variational equality solver, Betsy, Tau, yeah. and so on, and uh, is, there is a significant difference in the performances uh, you have, or the robustness? Has. I, I haven't checked that, so I, I can't really reply to that. But uh, like I, I, see the, I see the like intriguing thing about just using constraints on, well, I guess like at least like Petsy can do constraints on the primal variable. But can it do it on, say, the the, the strain? Yes, I mean, the, the, but not to do. Yes, I think so. You can then with Tau, I think you. Could. Okay, so then then that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if there. Yeah. Is it the issue here with the fact that there are multiple bodies? So I understand that uh, variational inequalities can be solved in an integrated way from the solver. But, but it seems to me that here the big work is on somehow getting two bodies with two different descriptions to yeah, actually so satisfy. Yes, yeah, so I think it, it would, and so I guess the, the problem would be that the gap formulation, I guess, as you, you kind of point out, is how to get that gap formulation to work nicely between all nodes in your problem, because like one node on one side is constrained by all the nodes on the other side or the, the geometrical position of them. I'm not sure how I would formulate that. Okay, thanks a lot. So just before closing, uh, Jorgen will be here uh, today and tomorrow, and tomorrow morning we'll give also a tutorial to our master students, but all people who like to join us can join, and it will be on the basics of Phoenix and uh, the also advanced features somehow, but uh, uh, it's tomorrow at uh, half past eight in uh, Amphi Airport. Okay, so thanks again to Jordan.